Um, so the first um, panel now, or well, the, the, first, the first talk will be already this kind of collaborative um, exercise from, um, that will tell you about one of our, our strands. In, uh, and in fact, what, what we're trying to do in, in these annual conferences is present projects where different strands are talking to each other. So that means different disciplines, different projects, um, and to see what, um, what points of contact there are, what, what we can, can gain from working together with each other. So Matthew Reynolds is from the Faculty of English um, in Oxford, Jane Hiddleston from the Faculty of Modern Languages, and Wen Chin Uyang from, um, from SOAS in London, which is uh, the, the sixth uh, or one, one, of the, one of the six um, uh, universities that are, are um, collaborating in this project. So um, having SOAS as part of that is obviously hugely enriching because it's giving us um, a kind of, sort of line into um, many different languages that um, are extremely exciting to have part of. So um, I will hand over to you. Uh, there's, a, there's a handout in your um, course packs as well. Um, okay, I'm from, um, I'm from the strand called uh, Prismatic Translation, and Jane and Wenchin are from a different strand. So as Catherine said, we're going to try to braid and do all sorts of exciting sailor knots. And um, in order to do that, we're just going to talk for eight to ten minutes each, and then I hope have a bit of a conversation after that. Um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, so the strand I'm involved in, Prismatic Translation, that's about things you can do with multiple translations. Um, and it's also about what happens if you think of translation as a process that inevitably generates many translations, and that's an interesting thing, um, rather than as a process that's fundamentally regulated by the desire to achieve equivalence in a particular context. Now, I'm not going to talk very much about translation multiplicity in itself today. Um, rather, I'm going to present some of the conceptual groundwork for, um, for, for that strand, um, because I hope that's going to interact or connect, um, interestingly, with, with what uh, Jane and Wenchin are going to say. Now, in order to do this, um, I'm going to look at three tiny snapshots of translation as it's been done in English literature, in English literature, across a stretch, stretch of centuries. And I'm choosing, in doing this, I'm choosing not to look at obviously experimental and multiple kinds of translation. I'm choosing not to look at multilingual texts in multilingual contexts or dialectal contexts. Um, I'm choosing not to look at places where what counts as translation is obviously put in question. Because what I wanted to do is look at what might be thought of as you know, core canonical instances of standard literary translation being done into a national literary tradition um, and try to look at them in a little bit of a new way and open up something of what's going on there. First one I want to look at is um, Arthur Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses from the 16th century. This is a text that Shakespeare read. Um, Ezra Pound later loved it. He called it the most beautiful book in the language. And the bit I've got here that I want to look at is from the incident of Apollo and Daphne. So remember, Apollo's been chasing Daphne. Daphne escapes from his clutches by being turned into a laurel tree. That's what's just happened or happening. is still just finishing happening here. But Apollo then stakes another claim to her by saying that even though she's escaped him by turning into a tree, she's going to be his tree, um, and her leaves are going to be his leaves and used to celebrate his art. Um, and this is how Golding writes uh, this moment. Uh, Pion in this uh, passage is a word for Apollo. Now, when the Pion of this talk had fully made an end, so that's him saying, I know you're going to be my tree now, the laurel, to his just request, did seem to condescend by bowing of her new-made boughs and tender branches down, and wagging of her seemly top as if it were her crown. Now, something's being newly made to happen in English here as a result of the work of translation. And that's partly the way Golding is handling these 14-syllable lines in order to get something of the movement of the hexameters. 14-syllable lines did already exist in English, but they weren't being used in quite the same way. And also by the wordplay from bowing to bows and seeming to condescend with a seemly top. And that's not exactly matching things happening in the Latin at that point, but it is reiterating and reproducing a tactic that Ovid is playing throughout this passage in different ways. 
Um, so this is something distinctive happening in English verse as a result of translation that wasn't being done before. This kind of writing, I think, is compelling in itself in the way that it wonders about what degree of consciousness might still be possessed by a person who's been or is being metamorphosed into a tree. You know, uh, the boughs wag. And is that a sign of something being said, or does it just seem to be a sign of something being said? Um, there's a feminist sensitivity here to the likelihood that Daphne might not actually be agreeing with Apollo, just seeming to in a seemly way. And it's that that's brought out by the wordplay. All these aspects of the writing were also important to Shakespeare and they nourished aspects of the wordplay, the verse, and of course the metamorphoses in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And that's something we could talk about for a long time. Um, but instead, I want to jump forward to um, my next example, which is from the early 18th century, to Alexander Pope's translation of Homer's Iliad. This was one of the massive literary hits of its time. And the bit I'm going to give you is a famous bit from the end of book eight, when the Greek army is camped out by night. And Homer says, their campfires are shining like stars in the air around the shining moon. Um, and shining is repeated, shining briefly, fine is repeated, shining briefly when the, brightly when the night is still. And what Pope writes is this. The troops exulting sat in order round and beaming fires illumined all the ground. As when the moon, refulgent lamp of night uh, heaven's clear azure spreads her sacred light. Where not a breath disturbs the deep serene, and not a cloud uh, casts the solemn scene. Around her throne the vivid planets roll, and stars unnumbered gild the glowing pole. Now this is an obviously expansive translation. It's much longer than uh, the two or four Homeric lines that Pope is rendering here. The reason for this, is that Pope, in translating, vividly felt the challenge of having to rise to Homer's sublimity. And his tactic for doing that was accretion. He felt that one phrase in English was not enough, so he'd add another and another. So here we have the moon, which is translated from Homer, but then retranslated within English into refulgent lamp of night and retranslated again further down into a throne. And there are other reiterations happening in this passage as well, and it's a characteristic of the style of the whole translation. And this again is a way with words, something distinctive and new happening in English verse as a result of the work of translation. And it was a huge success. You know, the translation as a whole was a huge success and this particular passage was very celebrated. And the style of uh, translation within a language, elaborative translation within the language, becomes part of the tactics of 18th century poetic diction. So much so that the next wave of poets, the Romantic poets in the early 19th century, reacted viciously against it. So for instance, Coleridge, talking about the passage we've been looking at, said, it's difficult to determine whether the sense or the diction be the more absurd. Um, so there again, we have translation creating something new in the way English verse is being done, so much so that later poets react against it. I'm gonna skip the next example on your sheet um, and come to rest on the last one, which is the beginning of W, a much more recent one, obviously, the beginning of W.G. Sebald's novel, Al whoops. Sorry, skip all these. Austerlitz, uh, translated by Anthea Bell. I'll just leave that there for you to, 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 to read. Sebald is, of course, a hugely admired and influential writer in English literature through English translation. This translation being done by Anthea Bell, the previous translations being done by Michael Halser with Sebald collaborating in that process of translation. So the question of which language these texts belong in um, is a complicated one. Here, too, all I want to do is flag that this is a style of writing that's come into being in English through the imaginative work of translation. It's partly a matter of sentence structure. So both sentences in German and as rendered into English are very distinctive, but also of word choice. Take, for instance, the phrase for study purposes in this passage. Second half of the 1960s, I traveled repeatedly from England to Belgium, partly for study purposes, partly for other reasons, and so on. 
Um, it's not translationese, but it is just a little bit to the side of the obvious colloquial phrase, which would be to study. You know, you travel somewhere to study. You don't really travel somewhere for study purposes. You get a visa for study purposes. Um, so it's a slightly unusual choice. And this sort of choice, which comes here from literal closeness to the German Studienstechen, creates the slight estrangement of language which makes the book such a compelling stylistic achievement. So those are my examples. Um, and the points I want to draw from them into dialogue with Jane and Wenchin, just, uh, just a few quick points. In all these cases, translation changes the language. It changes what it's possible to do in literary writing in English. So a model of translation, according to which translation happens out of one language into another language, with a language being conceived of as an already established array of means of expression, isn't right. Translation can change those means of expression. That's part of the reason why looking at multiple translations is interesting, just to gesture towards the, uh, the prismatic project. Next, these examples show that the binary terms in which translation is often talked about are too blunt. People talk of foreignizing versus domesticating. But that contrast is impossible to sustain in a literary realm which is necessarily already full of innovation and strangeness. So looking at these three examples, I can't decide whether to label them domesticating or foreignizing. The labels are just too stark, too blunt to fit. Then, um, uh, let's see, how do we think about um, creativity in translation? There's free translation, which people tend to assume is more creative than literal translation. There are versions, which again tend to be seen as more creative than mere translations. And so it's an idea in which creativity is a mode of sort of departure from the source. But in all my examples, the novelty, the thing newly created in English, has come as much from an endeavor to be close as from a wish to be free as much from fidelity as from invention. So creativity in translation um, is a more complex matter than it's perhaps often taken to be. Um, that's really where I'm gonna leave it. There are some passages on the back of your handout to prompt um, further thought and perhaps discussion, but I'm now going to hand over to Jane. Thank you. Okay, actually I'm not gonna open mine quite yet. <laughs> Just, I'm ready, that's good. Um, Great, so our strand um, is called Creativity and World Literatures, um, and it's actually about how multilingual writing um, might uh, help us to think again about the notion of world literature. So Matthew was talking about translation, translation kind of between texts. Um, when Chin and I are interested in, rather, um, in the brushing, sort of the brushing up of languages against one another um, within sort of individual literary texts. So I thought I'd start by saying a couple of things about this idea of world literature. Um, and then I'll give you a couple of kind of examples to, to give you a sense of what we're, what we're interested in. So the term world literature originates, in fact, with Goethe, who um, associated it with a sort of universalism, a kind of universal, most kind of canon of works. Um, but it was actually resurre resurrected and championed um, rather more recently um, by a range of, of critics, and including um, perhaps most famously a guy called David Damrosch. Um, and for Damrosch, um, world literature is a way of exploring the ways in which texts travel away from the context in which they were written, and in so doing, they generate new meanings. So it's basically, for Damrosch, it's about the circulation of texts around the world and between cultures, and he emphasizes that it's translation that does this. So basically, for Damrosch, world literature is above all about the circulation of texts through translation. But Damrosch still suggests, I think, that this notion of kind of worldliness, let's say, um, is something that happens to a text then after it's been translated. Um, and what I'm interested in, rather, is the ways, in fact, that, the ways in which the languages actually might come into contact with, with one another within the text itself. So there might actually be some kind of worldliness in the text, um, and I think multilingualism might be an important way of conceiving this worldliness. Um, just to explain the world, the term worldliness was actually um, one that was theorized, theorized extensively by um, Edward Said. And he saw worldliness as a way of being, he says, constitu constitutively opposed to the production of massive hermetic systems and therefore kind of open to the world. It was really a kind of way of sort of recognizing one's limitations, um, being open to questioning. Um, 
But I guess I'm saying that we might also think of this idea of worldliness as um, a way of describing the ways in which texts come to life through the dialogues that they maintain, perhaps with their place of creation, but also with broader, multiple other cultural histories, um, also with themselves and then also with their own languages. Um, and we could say that referencing multiple languages um, within a text is one way of sort of foregrounding and enacting that dialogue then. So worldliness, worldliness might be a way of looking at how texts, through their language um, and through the contacts and references with which they enter into dialogue, speak to other cultures as well as sort of enmeshing themselves in the world. Um, and this is a dimension I think that, that critics of world literature haven't sort of looked at that much. So there's been a lot of reflection on world literature and translation um, and there's been a kind of a backlash, a backlash against that um, by critics such, a, such as Emily Apter, who've said that actually, um, on some level, text is always untranslatable. So when you kind of celebrate the circulation of text through translation, you're not paying enough attention to the difficulties of translation. Um, my point, and I think um, Wen Chun's point as well, is really that um, even that model still focuses on translation. So worldliness is still somehow bound up with an idea of translation, um, whether that process is seen as sort of problematic or difficult or not. So as I say, creativity in world literatures um, is focused on texts that explore, dramatise and draw on more than one language. It's about ways of writing that expose linguistic interaction. Um, and this might be by incorporating words from another language um, into an apparently monolingual text. Um, it might also be through, through more sort of subtle rhythms and echoes. Um, the language might not be obviously multilingual, um, but nevertheless might reflect on its engagement with more, more than one, one language or cultural idiom or set of intertexts. And there are lots of different ways of staging that interaction, and that's one of the things that I'd like to look at in more detail. So sometimes that interaction implies a sense of kind of loss. Something is lost when, they, when these languages come into, into contact with one another. Sometimes it implies resolution. Um, in both cases, there's still a kind of sense that languages maybe have to remain kind of blocked off from one another. Um, so I think there might also be more complex ways of kind of thinking about how languages might be woven together. Um, and these might have all sorts of different ethical and political implications as well. So for the second half of what I want to do today, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how this relates to my own personal field of research, which is Francophone postcolonial literature. Um, and the postcolonial context, I think, generates very particular forms of multilingual, we could say plurilingual writing, as a result of a very complex and violent history. So the writers that I look at are often native speakers of Arabic or Berber, often to kind of varying degrees, um, but were educated in French. So they, find ways of, they need to find ways of writing in French that would somehow kind of allow these other languages to resonate. So they wrote, and they're writing both against a sort of assumed colonial um, assumption that uh, French is superior um, and that French is associated with sort of myths of clarity and logic. Um, at the same time, they're also writing against what was a, a fairly sort of um, aggressive and all-encompassing all -encompassing policy of Arabization in both Algeria and Morocco in a post-independence context. So those are two models, again, of languages as sort of self-enclosed um, and kind of clo yeah, closed off from one another. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you um, a really short poem first to have a look at, um, just to give you a bit of a sense of the kind of thing that I'm interested in. So this is a poem by an Algerian woman called Asya Jabbar. Um, and I've put the English translation there as well. I don't know whether... I'll, perhaps I'll read the French, and you can always kind of... You can see the translation. So she says, Ma poésie n'est que murmure, voix de rouge gorge ou, ou son de cuivre, fuit mon masque à hard troué. Même quand je tisse quelques mots en français, je retrouve mon langage étranger. So that's my translation, which is probably rubbish, but anyway, it gives you a sense of, of what she's saying. So I just thought I'd flag this up, because um, I thought there's a sense in which both languages, both French and Arabic, are kind of conveyed as incomplete or foreign here. So her poetry in French is described as just murmurs. It could be birdsong or perhaps a sort of metallic ringing, a kind of hollow metallic ringing sound. Um, Arabic, nevertheless, is also a mask, and it leaves gaps. In the last line, it's quite unclear which is the foreign language. Um, so is it, is she's saying that French is foreign to her. You see I put kind of two, two possible translations of that last line. That, that last line. Um, or is it that she finds traces of, her, of, a, of a language, of Arabic, that is foreign to French? Um, I think there are also two different kind of styles in the poem, maybe the, the first half and the second half um, use different kinds of language themselves. Um, and there's a sense in which there's something that the poem doesn't say. I think it's kind of foregrounding something about how both languages are maybe sort of insufficient. 
So that's all I'm going to say about that poem. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about another writer, um, a, a guy called um, Abdel Kabir Khatibi, who's a Moroccan thinker, who probably um, has one of the most sophisticated and extended reflections on this kind of multilingual writing. Um, and I think he says some kind of really interesting, um, he says some really interesting things about the sort of broader implications and the complexity also of bilingual or multilingual aesthetics. So Katibi came up with this idea of what he called a, a pensée autre, a pensée en langue, which is a kind of thinking in languages. And it was also supposed to be a response to divisiveness and exclusionism in both colonial and theocratic thinking. Um, at the same time, it was also a broader ethical philosophy, and I'll try and kind of convey in what way um, today. Um, so this thinking in languages, I think, suggests, again, an idea of worldliness. Uh, it's a way of being alert to cultures and codes around the world. <coughs> Um, ways of alluding to different idioms, cultural references within a text, not necessarily just by inserting foreign words, um, but through sort of musicality, through imagery. And this is also, importantly, not just a celebration of linguistic play, but an attack on metaphysics on both sides of the Mediterranean. Interestingly enough, although Katibi also writes a lot about Maghrebian culture, um, I'm going to tell you something about a rather more unusual text that he writes, which is actually about... Um, the idea of a kind of a, a translator working in Sweden. So actually in itself it's quite significant that he also kind of looked outside that post-colonial context because he's also kind of concerned to sort of test these sort of national boundaries. Um, so this text is called Anatia Stockholm, so a, a summer in Stockholm, um, and it's about a translator who's working in Stockholm. And as I say, I think it demonstrates some of the kind of broader ethical and political significations of writing in many languages. Um, so as I say, the, the main character is this figure of a simultaneous translator, and this in itself is a sort of a figure for openness to linguistic nuance. So he's also, he says, a professional traveller. He both literally travels and he's ethically in his work always kind of travelling and conceiving himself in relation with others. Um, his translations record an intense receptiveness to different languages. He says, une immense oreille m'habite, um, like an immense ear lives inside me, which sounds very bizarre in English, but um, there's an idea there of... Um, a translator kind of required to be, um, he says, successively himself and an other, and, and, it, and it requires this state of a sort of heightened alertness, um, receptiveness to nuance and tone. And this is conceived, I think, by Katibi as almost a kind of figure, a way of describing his writing as a whole. Um, another aspect to um, this kind of interaction between languages, what he calls the interlangue, so interlanguages, is that in this text it's also related to political neutrality, so the text is set in Sweden. Um, and neutrality and interlangue both work against colonialism. They call for disarmament, the avoidance of war, um, the favouring of communication, for which, of course, languages are required. And he says an idea of um, discernment, discernment, which would be reflectiveness, um, attentiveness, and the refusal of rapid judgment. Um, finally, the figure of the interlangue of this um, interaction between languages also, also demands a kind of rethinking of interpersonal relationships, um, it's a kind of vision of relationships of, made up of exchange and freedom. Um, what he calls immense, which is another completely untranslatable word. It's made up of kind of, it's a kind of process of loving, I guess you could see. Um, but also a non-proprietary form of love. One that demonstrates openness to the other, dialogue, listening and tolerance rather than ownership. It evolves, in fact, out of a dialogue with the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, um, who describes it as, um, translating hurriedly, he sort of describes it as a, a relation of kind of tolerance, um, a way of knowing how to live together between gender, sensibilities, thoughts, um, religions, and cultures. So it's a friendship without judgment, without ownership, and open to change. And again, I think this, along with this vision of um, the professional translator and of political neutrality, all of these perform then the ethics of the translator and the writer who sort of shapes his craft through translation, through bringing languages together. I'm just going to make a final quick kind of cautionary point um, at the end of my talk. Um, and this is really just to kind of foreground how, in the post-colonial context, we mustn't just over-celebrate this idea of sort of cultural hybridization as unproblematic and, um, and sort of joyful and celebratory. I just wanted to foreground how this is also, um, this takes, takes place against a background of suffering. Um, and there can be a tendency perhaps to kind of over-celebrate, as I say, the sort of subversiveness of, of bilingual writing. So a writer called Doris Summer has talked about um, 
bilingual games, and she says that these kind of, she says they irritate the state, um, and she says that almost that, that democracy is, um, the challenge, uh, sorry, democracy is kind of bound up with, uh, with this openness to kind of multiple languages. She says, democracy depends on constructing these miraculous and precarious points of contact from mismatches among codes and peoples. So it's very important for her then that this kind of um, interlingual, bilingual, multilingual writing undermines the association of power with cultural uniformity. But as I say, I, I kind of foregrounded that example of Katibi because I wanted to show how um, multilingual writing might be both a gift but also the legacy of a history of suffering. It's a promise of freedom that's also terrifying or overwhelming. So writing between languages here is curiously a paradoxical process of both enfranchisement and disenfranchisement. It's both liberation and loss. It might be culturally, politically, ethically, and personally, both challenging and emancipatory, but it might also record an encounter that was devastatingly painful. So I'm gonna stop there and hand over to, to Wen Chen. It's great to have two colleagues precede me because they have set up the projects perfectly for me, and all I have to do is say something about where my part fits. And I'm going to start with linking my project with Matthew's thinking and then Jane's thinking and then go into my own, you can call it. This top one. Yeah, yeah, the top one. Uh, and as you've heard from Matthew, and I think we're all coming from sort of our relationship with word literature and comparative literature and how these two disciplines or fields have theorized word literature and how to study literature. And one of the sort of like objections or some of the objections we have is really circulation through translation and the function of translation within the circulation of text, and in particular in theories of word literature, circulation is always about the novel as a form itself. So that's number one. And number two, right, is, is, is the sort of circulation through translation without paying close attention to the wordliness of literally text themselves. And from what we have heard from Matthew right, and Jane is that translation itself is a collaboration of multiple languages that itself leads to creativity within a single language. And from Jane's is that language interact, engage in dialogue within literally text and which give literally text its wordliness as well. And I want to use these two ways of thinking about language, right, through translation or through literary text to think about multilingualism inherent in a single language itself. And I want to be able to think about how that multilingualism inherent in a, a single language is the outcome, is the law, is born out of culture encounters, but at the same time, it generates a new language, a new energy for language that allows this language to generate other forms of literary writings as well. And I go back in history and I situate myself in the 19th century Arabic print culture. So I'm going to think about Arabic as multilingual itself. And the reason I go to the 19th century, because 19th century in Arabic is seminal for a lot of Cult, new cultural regeneration and culture, new cultural production. The short story, the novel, and the play, for example, traveled into Arabic in the 19th century, and by the 20th century, they become part of and parcel of the modern Arabic literary landscape. But how did that happen, right? Did it happen simply because Arab authors went to Paris or London, read Arab, uh, French and English novels, and decided, voila, fantastic, let's write in these forms. Or, right, there's something else that went on that preceded this kind of possibility, so by the time the short story, the novel, the play travel into Arabic, they become Arabic expressions of the forms themselves. But, um, so this is just an idea, and I want to be able to sort of like think about, right, how language is at the center of this kind of creative energy in literature. Um, so I'm very inept uh, technologically, so just wait a second, right? And I want to sort of like, sort of, I have like eight to 10 minutes, so I don't want to sort of talk too much or theorize too much, but I want to give you an example of the kind of sort of 19th century Arabic 
magazine, and this is a satirical magazine, that is the site of both cultural, literary, of all cultural, literary, and linguistic encounters that led to the creation of new Arabic, right? But this is fun, right? And Yaqub Sanwa was an Egyptian Jew, Jacob Sanwa, or sometimes James Sanwa, who was born in Cairo in 1839 and died in Paris in 1912. He was an Egyptian Jew, and he was a sort of like a nationalist, uh, a journalist, an activist, a playwright, and he knew Arabic very well. He wrote in Arabic, the classical Arabic, Egyptian Arabic, and he spoke English and wrote English, French, Turkish, Persian, Hebrew, and Italian. Oh, right. Right? And, right, he started a satirical magazine called Abu Naddara in Egypt in 19, uh, sorry, that's wrong. 1877 to 1879. Sorry, I, I typed this at late at night. So it's 19th century. So 1870, 1877 to 1878. And this magazine was published in Egypt. And Egypt at the time was under sort of British, pseudo British colonization. Right? And they found him very offensive. So they banished him to Paris. And this journal, he published this journal in Paris uh, until 19. 18, uh, 1910, that's, that, that's correct, right? So as you can see from the cover of the journal, right, it is in French, but it's also multilingual, as you'll see later, and it combines images with words, right? And this is, right, in black and white, or black and yellow, uh, and you can see, right, the presence of French, Arabic and Egyptian English, uh, right? And, and this journal comments on the contemporary situation of Egypt as he experienced, experienced it, right? And this makes fun of all the characters he could see in Egypt, right? And this is a peasant figure, right? And here, the comment in Egyptian Arabic is lamenting the fate of an Egyptian uh, peasant who is destined to die in poverty while right, the minister is getting fatter right, and the servant is serving the minister, right, leaving the peasant in an impoverished state. Right? And this is an instance of conceptual blending right? And this is the kind of thing that I want to look at in the project is conceptual blending within language itself and how it happens. And I chose this one because it visualizes it for you, right? There's an English soldier who wreaked havoc in Egypt, and so you can see that it's a flood going on, whereas the English soldier is sitting on top of a pyramid watching the rest of the people being washed away. But once you read the Arabic, right? You, you, you see references to bi the biblical flood, but at the same time, at the end of it, it contains a threat to the colonizers. You think you can do this to us, pretty soon we're going to right, conduct ourselves in such a way that we will we'll have a revolution and kick you out of our beloved country. Right? And this one, making fun, right, sat satire of Egypt towards the end of the 19th century, right? And this is about like an auction, right? Sale of Egyptian antiquities, right? And basically what he is saying is that our Egyptian history is being sold to the highest bidder. So, uh, so what, what remains of our history if we sell our antiquities, right? And this is the most interesting one. And sorry, the, the sort of uh, the print is not very clear. But here, this one, right, where is where you find new concepts beginning to travel into Arabic. And this is about right this man, an Egyptian, who travels to Paris to escape the condition in Egypt and encounters. Parisians and Parisian culture, 
and there is where you begin to get interesting ideas. Oh, sorry, this one is wrong. Right? And as you, and you, you, you can tell this by comparing 19th century writing to earlier writings, right? And here you begin to see on your left-hand side column, is on my left-hand side column, right? First paragraph, he is beginning to insert into his writing two ideas. One, love of the nation, right? Nationalism, beginning of nationalism, right? Nationalism as love, dedication, patronism to the idea of a nation state that's Egypt, that is sovereign, independent, and free, right? And later on, you will have democratic. And the second one, freedom, right? right? Nationalism and freedom. And finally, once you have these con two concepts coming in, you have liberation uh, somewhere, right? It becomes like we come to Europe, right? Because for our love of our country, for our love of freedom, and we come here in search of liberation, right? So this is what, what we see within the Arabic language is that by translating concepts or translating or adapting concepts into Arabic, right? Arabic regenerates itself as a modern language through this kind of processes of conceptual blending that is part and parcel of language itself that takes place within language, not just within text. And we are talking about text, but we're also talking about the nitty gritty details of language. So many new concepts traveled into the Arabic language, not through translation, but through adaptation and adoption, right? And these would generate a new kind of Arabic that would make Arabic also rethink its relationship to its other registers. Right? As we see in this one, we have classical Arabic and Egyptian colloquial existence side by side. And from there, through writing right, in forms that were not known before, a magazine article, newspaper article, right, it also made it possible for other genres to travel into Arabic and to address a new audience with a new purpose. So 19th century is very important in the literary history of Arabic literature, mainly understood as, as a time of encounter with the West and a time of borrowing literary genres from the West. What I'd like to be able to do through these projects is to think about it differently, think about it as cultures in dialogue, as literatures in dialogue, but more importantly, as languages in dialogue, in that through engaging with other languages, Arabic acquires a new energy. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. It's a question uh, uh, to. Well, we started with uh, with Jane, and um, of course, uh, if if you all want to comment, um, uh, uh, that the poem in uh, French that you you showed, and the case with uh, many other uh, by national bilingual uh, or uh, authors. Uh, there is a lot of um, I've, a lot of the writing. There is this uh, thing of like the language as identity. So I was wondering if you uh, have a, a like a what's your what's your vision, uh, your view on that? As uh, like for me, for instance, that poem strikes me as like she doesn't feel uh, in any language that uh, her identity is there. And I've I've heard from someone rushed to once in a festival something like the same thing, you know. 
for the search for your identity uh, through the language as well is very heavy and behind uh, not only the form but the the concept ideas uh, in the in the texts. Um, shall I just speak? Shall I join the microphone? I think yeah, that's absolutely right. I think that um, all these speaker, uh, all these writers are precisely um, undermining that assumption that language and identity come together. That language defines identity. Um, so you could say that the, the kind of French model imposed was that by, the idea was that by, um, by imposing French on, on people in, in the colonies, they would sort of somehow learn French culture and absor absorb a French identity. Um, and then similarly with the Arabization policies much later, there was a sense in which this was about affirming a new national identity through language, um, through culture, through religion. Um, and all the writers that I'm looking at um, find these two models much too kind of stark. Um, the interesting thing about a lot of them is also that it's not even a question of being kind of somehow caught between two languages. Actually, there are also references to Berber um, and various forms of Arabic um, and other languages too. I mean, in fact, the Spanish and Italian were spoken in the Maghreb. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that, that's the kind of the one assumption that they're working to undermine. Can I also say something about that? And I think it's um, sort of in the post-colonial studies, and then I think it's in, in the historical period when languages are imposed as part of the agenda of, for example, in integration. I mean, you know, a language can be a mark of identity, and you feel much more strongly about it, right? Because you think that's your identity. But sort of like, but as you move away from that kind of sort of dynamics with language. Uh, and I speak for personal, from personal experience, is that, no, you know, you, 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 you define language as much as your languages give you a sense of, of, of articulation, right, and, and a way of thinking about it. So in a sense, you know, uh, multilingual people, I mean, do, do, you know, in, in, in a lot of writings, multilingual people are always perceived as people who are conflicted within themselves. Right? Is, is like, you know, you have to choose between Arabic and French, Arabic and Chinese. But I don't think that's the case with most of multilingual people, because multilingualism, I believe, is very much part of our life on a day to day basis. Yeah, just, just to um, chime in with that. I mean, almost a, a danger with the word multilingual or multilingualism is that it conjures up a a, a, a division between the multilingual and the monolingual. Um, and something I want to kind of pick up on from what, Chin, what Wen Chin's been saying and bring into any language, any standard language, but say English, um, is that there's a, you know, there's a continuum of language variety um, and the division between you know, national standard languages, a language like English and a language like French, is something that's come into being through long cultural and um, you know, state-sponsored processes. Um, and so something I'm, I'm very keen to do is take the kind of thinking that Wen Chin's been doing about multilingualism and just bring it into thinking about national literary traditions, the texts that I was looking at, um, which get labeled, you know, we'll, we'll say, you know, take a text that gets labeled an English literary text, but what's meant by English then? You know, the words that are on the page have come from many different languages in just the same way as Wen Chin's been talking about. And one of the things you can do in reading it is be alert to that inherent, you know, variety and multilingualism in the text and see the continuity between that and texts which sort of get, you know, which are obviously multilingual texts. Um, and so that's something we're, we're kind of all interested in doing. Are we done?